Hello, everybody. Welcome to another talk on this YouTube channel. Since we are all sitting at home due to COVID-19 and we spend a lot of time in front of our computers, I thought it would make sense to record a video of some past talk that I gave. And I went through the archive and I found this talk. It is a keynote presentation that I gave in 2017 at the ESOS um, conference. And it's about hunting for vulnerabilities with machine learning. And I think it's still interesting today because it does not talk a lot about the recent hype around machine learning and deep learning and neural networks. But instead, um, a large portion of this talk is about the glue between source code and the learning algorithms. Um, and um, I thought taking the original slides is a good idea. So this is not somehow refactured. It's the original presentation. And maybe I'm also commenting a little bit um, on things that have changed in the last three years or that I would present differently nowadays. So let's just go on. Uh, typically, I would introduce myself here. So I'm Konrad Rieck. Um, but I think for a YouTube channel, it's not necessary to talk very long about um, oneself. So if you're interested, go to this website. This is the website of my institute. Um, you can find all information about our research and teaching there. So instead, I would like to start with um, a basic view on security. Um, if, you, if you start from a very top level on looking at security, um, uh, you will notice that this is a dynamic process where we have prevention, detection, and analysis stages. And when I talk to students about this for the first time, I um, pick the example of a dentist. Um, I'm using this example because it's a little bit painful and this is, uh, it's, it's a good motivation to think about something because pain is a strong uh, force. And also everybody knows what a dentist is doing. So what is a dentist is doing? The first thing that a dentist does is telling you to brush your teeth. Um, even in kindergarten, this is kind of the first thing that the, the small kids learn, brush your teeth. And this is prevention. So what is meant is try all of your available techniques and resources to prevent attacks. In this example, against your teeth, but in the IT world, against computers. And then we also know that prevention is never 100% secure. So we need a detection stage. And this is when you go to the dentist and he or she looks into your mouth and, well, maybe finds something evil in there. And if this happens, so if something malicious is detected in a computer system or in your, <laughs> in your mouth, and then we need to analyze it, understand it, and harden our system or our prevention mechanisms such that the same problem does not occur um, again. And this is basically the drilling process of the dentist. Uh, and this circle continues. And, um, and um, in the case of the dentist, it continues maybe for your whole life. And I'm afraid that it will also continue for the security world and computer systems. But the situation in computer security is a little bit worse, I would say, because in the last 10 years, uh, we have seen an increasing number of attacks and malicious code. The systems that we use become more and more complex. We have all sorts of new ideas, internet of things, fantasies, um, pervasive computing, ideas, all this stuff that is maybe a little bit too much science fiction, but that influences the industry and leads to new software and hardware products and increases the attack surface of the whole IT business. And preventing has become a nightmare in this business. And also detection is limited by resources and analysis as well. So something is a little bit wrong. Maybe not a little bit, it's wrong. <laughs> and if we want to approach this problem, the best thing would be to eliminate the root cause of this evil and the root cause are vulnerabilities. So anything that enables an attacker to breach security goals, like compromising confidentiality, integrity or availability of something. Here's a list of popular flaws that I um, presented in this keynote talk. Today, of course, I would choose different talks, uh, different flaws. And I would also maybe show some of the more hip hardware vulnerabilities that have uh, impacted security research in the last two years. But nonetheless, I mean, the overall story 
remains the same. So there's a, a, a continuous flow of new vulnerabilities coming to the surface. And whenever this happens, uh, new security breaches occur and we need to defend against them. We need to detect them. We need to analyze them and then um, circle around in this security process. And this is uh, a slide that has been copied exactly from Fabian Yamaguchi. So I will later tell you, tell you about uh, who this is. Um, vulnerabilities are not only an interesting research topic, they are also um, a market thing. So vulnerabilities can be sold, they can be traded. There are different players in this field. So you have companies that do a vulnerability discovery, you have governments, you have criminals. And um, if you find something in a very important piece of software, let's say an iOS jailbreak exploit or exploit capable to do a jailbreak, you can earn a lot of money with this. And um, as a result, researchers, but also industry has recognized that vulnerability discovery is an interesting topic. Now, um, as a researcher, then I have to say, well, there are some vulnerabilities that are very easy to detect. Uh, we know these insecure functions in C, for example, that nobody should use. And if, if these functions are used, obviously there's a security problem um, likely, right? But there are many other cases of errors that are not so easy to detect. Sometimes they are very subtle. So are, sometimes they live in an in interpretation of the developer that is not perfectly fitting the re reality. And this minor gap between the idea of a software and its later usage or its later interfacing with other systems leads to security problems. And these bugs are difficult to find. Now, fortunately, we have already some machinery for spotting vulnerabilities. Most importantly today, fuzzing. Fuzzing has been super um, uh, trendy in the last two to three years and there has been great progress. New ideas like adding symbolic execution or lightweight symbolic execution, taint analysis, um, gray box fuzzing as a compromise between white box and black box fuzzing. So there's a lot of work going on. Still, I would say um, the statement below that most of the cool bugs are found by manual auditing holds. Um, the real strong things like Heartbleed, or maybe it's now the hard, um, hardware bugs like Meltdown and Spectra, they have been discovered by experts looking at the problem and not by testing or other approaches. And even worse, if we take our theory glasses on, these are not theory glasses, by the way, um, but if we would take them on and look at the problem, we could immediately see um, this is an undecidable problem finding vulnerabilities in software. Because um, if we have a system for detection, this corresponds to a Turing machine in the theoretical world. The software itself corresponds to a Turing machine. So we have one Turing machine analyzing another Turing machine. And if you have heard about the halting problem or Rice theorem, you know that one Turing machine analyzing non-trivial properties of another one is an undecidable problem. And there will never be a universal approach for this. Um, a problem. So we can only have small steps that help us make something better in a restricted setting, but not the universal general solution. And this is why Fabian and me um, came up with this picture, maybe in 2012 or 2013. Um, so the idea is that these vulnerabilities and the value of them is somehow hidden in the, the floor. And it's a little bit like gems or truffles. It's something very valuable. And we need people that find these valuable um, gems or truffles or whatever you, this gold inside um, uh, the earth. And instead of replacing these researchers, which are shown here as uh, friendly animals, um, um, we had the idea of helping them, assisting them in the task. So it was not the idea of building an automatic, super cool AI and today I'm even skeptical that such an AI can exist for vulnerabilities, but instead the goal was to provide the researchers with powerful tools that are driven by machine learning, but that still enable the expert to make um, his or her own decisions.
And um, the idea was to make the process more effective, not replacing the analyst, but supporting him or her. And we also decided to um, become a little bit fuzzy in the whole field. So if you look into software engineering and program analysis, there's a strong focus on being sound and complete, which means that the approaches uh, that are developed there, they are very exact. So if they find something, in many cases, they can say this is definitely um, the thing we are looking for. But since we know that for vulnerabilities, a sound and complete approach that can find all vulnerabilities can never exist, we said, well, why not be a little bit fuzzy and leave the final rest of the analysis to a human expert? Overall, by the way, I think it's, it's generally a good idea um, to mix artificial intelligence and humans. And humans. I think it's, a, it's not a good trend to say this technology will replace humans. Um, in my experience, it's very far away from doing this. But it can really help. It can augment the view of an analyst and it can give suggestions and um, maybe do boring work and leave the funny, interesting work to the expert. And we did this starting from 2011 uh, and did ha had a couple of, um, I think, cool papers uh, starting from this time on uh, different aspects. And I have to say here that most of this work and all of the ideas or almost all of the year, came from Fabian Yamaguchi. He's known as Fabs uh, also, and uh, he did his PhD around this topic, and all of the papers have been um, authored by him as a first author. Of course, there's always a team behind this work. Also, many other people of my group contributed, but Fabian was the head. Uh, and he founded a company in 2016 um, or 17? 17, I would say now. Um, and this company is marketing this idea. So I have a slide at the end that talks a little bit about the company. But if you're interested in this, how this developed further, and especially how this developed into real-world security products, please visit Shift Left and the website there. So talking about all these papers would be too much for a keynote. So I decided to focus on our very first work. Um, and I think in, in the aftermath, it's always good to start with the beginning. Um, if you look into the middle or the end, very often things have become complex and complicated and they developed. And for a talk that maybe doesn't aim at an expert audience, um, it's sometimes hard to follow if research talks are too far away from what people know. So I picked the first one here for this keynote. Um, still, it will be a little bit technical, of course, but um, I... I just point then to the remaining work and we will now look at vulnerability expo expo extrapolation. Um, this is, uh, has been one of the first papers that we wrote in 2011, I think. It was at the Wood Workshop and then at the EXEC conference. Uh, uh, we had the fortune to work with Markus Lottmann and Felix Lindner. And um, it was uh, the, the whole approach derived from the diploma thesis of Fabian. Um, and let's start with, this is the original slides from um, Fabian, a little bit pimped to the style and maybe a little bit more visually um, uh, yeah, pimped, but uh, that's the original um, uh, slide. So here we can see what we called at that time a modern vulnerability. So it's now already nine years old, <laughs> so it's not modern anymore, but it's a little bit different from the typical string cat, string copy vulnerabilities, these buffer overflows that are often shown in academic talks. So what is happening here? So this is part of Pigeon. Um, Pigeon is an instant messaging client, um, open source. Uh, it's, I think, um, used in Linux a lot. I also used it for a long time. And you can see here um, a very, I think, subtle vulnerability. So we have in red, wait, I, I think I can write on the slide. Uh, we can see here in red two cases where somebody is reading in data, in particular, the username and the message from some other instant messaging client are read into the system. And in most of the cases, what is, comes in is UTF-8 encoded. So the developer um, at that point said, okay, so likely uh, this is UTF-8. Okay, everything is fine. And then later here, the data is given to a message handler. This is some function pointer that, depending on the particular service, might implement different functionality. But at this point, 
the username and the message have to be UTF-8 encoded. So this, in this case, it's not something like usually the case, but it has to be the case. Otherwise, there is a missing input validation and we have a, an access violation vulnerability. So what is happening here is one of these subtle vulnerabilities that I talked about uh, a few minutes ago. So the developer has some assumption about uh, what is going on. He starts with seeing that most of the messages are all in practice are typically UTF-8. So he says, okay, I do not need to think about this anymore. And later this assumption becomes a requirement and creates a vulnerability in the system. So we had this vulnerability as our starting point. And we said, well, if this is the mindset of the developer, maybe he or she has made the same problem at other places. So maybe this is some kind of problematic programming pattern, something that is wrong in the idea of the developer, but that is not so explicit that we can directly write it down. And wouldn't it make sense to look for similar problems given this single vulnerability? And this is why we call this an extrapolation. So the idea is I have one stupid bug somewhere and I want to check a software project for similar bugs. So I want to know, is this problem happening also at other locations in my code base? And it's already clear, this is not the typical uh, machine learning problem. And it's far away from this deep learning hype because we have one training instance, not one million, one, right, one. So we cannot do this classification learning where we have two classes and then we have thousands of iterations over this data, but instead we need to do something different. And Fabian had the idea of first getting a good representation of the data and then see what we can do with this representation. And I like this approach a lot. And I'm still telling my PhD students, it's good to think about the representation of the data first. Do not be somehow... Um, um, forced or the feeling of starting because it needs to be learning. Much of the learning things are important. No, very often the underlying representation plays um, the key role in the success of the system. And we started with the most basic uh, representation of code, which is an abstract syntax tree. This is a standard um, uh, representation in compiler design and software engineering. On the left side, you can see um, a C function. It's a very simple C function. And if you look to the right side, you can see this AST. And um, in red, these small arrows, you can see we have the statements encoded, we have the types encoded, we have conditions encoded, we have calls encoded. Actually, everything from the code is represented here in a structured way. So it's a very, very powerful representation. And it's also the basis for many other representations. So you can use an AST and then construct a control flow graph or a data flow graph or a, um, a data dependence graph just from analyzing the AST. So it's really like the, the basic representation of a program. And then we thought, how can we go from this representation to machine learning? And um, the interesting thing is that actually most learning algorithms cannot work on this data. Don't be fooled by any media articles. Um, typically, machine learning operates in a vector space. There is, of course, some work on learning with trees and graphs and strings, but the vast majority of learning is working in a vector space. So the first thing that you need to do to get access to this vast majority of learning algorithms is to bring your data into this vector space. And we did something inspired from our natural language processing which can be sort of as a back of trees representation or back of subtrees representation. So we said, okay, let's think that the trees are some form of language and the language is defined by subtrees. So it's not words in this case, but subtrees. And let's just take all available subtrees from our data and associate each subtree with one dimension of a vector space. So if we have 10,000 subtrees in our data set, um, we would have 10,000 dimensions. And then we can take one AST and map it to a vector by counting how often the different subtrees occur in this, um, in this tree. And each frequency is then uh, mapped to the corresponding dimension in the vector space. 
Um, if this sounds strange to you, uh, it's a classical back of words model in natural language processing, or classically, this was called, was called a vector space model in information retrieval. The only difference is that we're not using words, but subtrees as our unit of describing a tree. And then we basically followed the idea of natural language processing and information retrieval. And um, Fabian found this very simple and very elegant approach called latent semantic analysis. It's from the 70s and it's actually about learning the topics in a group of text documents. So assume you have a group of text documents and they all are concerned with cooking. So they are cooking um, recipes. So um, yeah, you learn about, I don't know, how to cook something, um, a piece of meat or something. Um, and now we want to take all these documents and we want to find out what are the topics in these documents. So maybe there's some kind of higher topics so something like a fruit salad receipt or something like uh, cooking with no butter and things like that. Um, and this can be done with latent semantic analysis. And the idea is that if several documents have the same topic, they share the same words to some extent. So they make use of the same words more often than other documents. Um, and th thus they create um, a direction in the feature space and basically you can take a vector and let it go through this direction and describe this group of documents by a um, directional vector. And this vector contains especially those words that appear rather often in the documents. Uh, this would be called a topic vector in this setting. And in the case of the fruit salad, it would contain with high values all the fruits and with rather low values those things that are unrelated um, to our fruits. When I'm looking at the slides right now, uh, it, it, it reads Forelle there, and that's a German word, and it means um, trout, I think. So it's a fish. Uh, and uh, we thought that a fish doesn't belong in a fruit salad. Of course, I know that food is also a complex topic, and maybe there's a fruit salad with fish, but uh, in our standard world, maybe it's not that usual. Okay, so now we take this concept and apply this very same concept to the source code that we have embedded using this mapping to a feature space. And what would happen? Well, these topic vectors would now describe common combinations of subtrees. So we would represent a topic as a set of subtrees that belong together. And since the subtrees are part of abstract syntax trees, they contain information about the structure, the syntax, and also a little bit about the semantics of the code. So we have these snippets, and we are basically looking for frequent combinations of these snippets. Or not only frequent, but patterns of these snippets that occur frequently together. So as an example here, instead of having a fruit salad, we might have um, a check. So what, let, let me write this here. So we have something like a check where something is compared and then later uh, a man copy operation is called. So why? Because typically before you would copy something into a buffer, you might want to check whether the buffer is large enough. So this could be something like a pattern in the code that represents a topic in our world. And um, we did exactly this. So we basically modeled source code in terms of topics like structural patterns that are frequent combinations of subtrees. And this is a very, very powerful thing, although it's not so complicated. Um, and the reason is that with many of these topic modeling um, techniques, um, there also comes um, the um, concept of dimension reduction and denoising. Because instead of taking the original data, you can now project the data onto these directional vectors. This is not much different from projecting onto another basis or so. Uh, you're just projecting on the topic vectors. And as a result, your data is not described by words anymore or subtrees, but it's described as a mixture of topics or structural patterns. So in a text, you would say this text is 90% about fruit salads and 10% about cooking without butter. 
And for a program, you could say this is 90% about checking memory and copying buffers and 10% about reading from files. So it's a way of casting um, the, the feature world into a completely different domain, the domain of these structural patterns. And then when you do a projection, you can project the data not onto all structural patterns, but maybe onto only those that occur very often or that have a strong support in the data. And this is what we did. And this leads to denoising. So in other terms, going back to the text example, we remove all those topics that have very little support in the, our corpus. And we just focus on those topics that are strongly supported, that happen often. As a result, we reduce the complexity of the feature space. We get less dimensions. And in this new feature space, something interesting happens. If there's a data point, let's pick not the vulnerability, but first this one here, um, other data points close to it have similar topics. So they are, and this means they have similar structural patterns. So they have similar code patterns. And if we now have a vulnerability like this one here, and we draw some sphere around it, some circle, um, and look into all the other source code um, snippets that are close to it, um, we know that they share the same structural patterns and maybe they suffer from the same vulnerability because our assumption is that the vulnerability is related to the structural patterns. This was the idea from Fabian for extrapolation of vulnerabilities and I still think it's a very, very cool idea. Um, and underneath, it has a very simple pattern. If we even drop all the topic modeling, what happening, what's happening here is that we are basically denoising code. So remove, we remove all the stuff that appears rarely, that doesn't appear um, frequently together. So all these individual events like a certain coding something that is not happening very often. And as a result, we get something like the essence of the program. And then we hunt if a vulnerability contains something from the essence, these structural patterns, we can look for other code that contains the same patterns and maybe the same vulnerability. So does this really work in practice? Um, good question. So we did an evaluation on four software projects that had known vulnerabilities. And we, we did just the following. We took these known vulnerabilities, we extracted all the functions from the software and then looked whether which of these functions are close to the vulnerability and what is going on with these functions. And we picked uh, popular targets for this kind of analysis like Pigeon, LibTIFF, FFmpeg, Asterisk. And um, this is how we started. And then I remember this, um, Fabian, Fabian came to my office and said, well, um, we know one vulnerability, but how can we make sure that we find something new or how do we know what would be candidates for vulnerabilities. So what code snippets uh, should we find? And because we need to evaluate our approach, we need some ground truths. And I said, well, we need ground truths. Um, and maybe uh, we have to do this manually because we are competing with humans and the idea is to improve their performance. Um, and so Fabian had to spend two weeks going through these functions and checking by hand whether patterns present in the vulnerability are also present in one of these functions. And this was a very, very tedious process. And I'm very happy that Fabian went through it and uh, took this burden um, because it enabled us to have something like a ground truth where we can say a human expert would say, this is an interesting function, it's a candidate. And if our approach can find these candidates, uh, this is good. And if it misses a candidate, this is bad. And we did an experiment for this. Uh, we have several results on this, but I'm showing here some um, condensed um, plot. So here you can see all the functions of the four projects as a, uh, yeah, so to say as a, as a long plot. And each of these red lines is a candidate. So each red line corresponds to an interesting function that should have been analyzed. And the first thing that I noticed is um, most of the important, no, all of the candidates are within the first 16% of the functions. If we sort them by um, similarity or closeness to the original vulnerability, that's pretty good because it means a practitioner could start with this uh, sorted functions 
and go slowly through them and would find all candidates after visiting 60%. That's a real strong improvement. And in some cases, so for example here, um, we had all of the candidate functions directly sorted at the top. In other cases, so let's say in FFmpeg, um, still everything was close, but there were also some false positives in there. And I want to be completely honest here and do not do any hyping. So we also had something like an asterisk where some candidates were far away, not super far, but um, the analyst would have to go to all these false positives. And um, the question is, would he or she do it? Or would he or she become bored and say, I'm going with the first ones? When we manually went through the first 10 percent, or is it 10 percent? It's even less. I think the first 5 percent of these functions, and we checked whether there have been really vulnerabilities in there. So far, I've been talking about candidates. So functions that are structural and from the programming perspective similar, but not um, definitely contain the same vulnerability. And we did an analysis and we found about 10 unknown vulnerabilities in these programs. And unknown here means that they have been all assigned CVE numbers. So it's, um, it's not something that doesn't matter, but it's real vulnerabilities and not just software defects. This was a great success. And um, uh, here's an example of a vulnerability that we discovered. Um, it's exactly a similar pattern as shown in the very beginning. So we have here uh, the beginning from um, the start of the talk. This is where the programmer assumes that UTF-8 is um, um, used here where it is required. And the exact same problem happens here as well. This is another function um, and um, this is uh, the very same problem. So how did we proceed the chapter two of this talk? Uh, how did we proceed from there? So as I said, this was just the first beginning, maybe the first half year of the PhD thesis from Fabian Yamaguchi. And we did a lot of work then and more people joined our team. So we had Nico Golde, um, Alvin Meyer, Daniel A. Pugelgaskan, Christian Bresenegger is missing on the slides here because he didn't contribute to the paper I'm referencing, but he also worked on this and many more that I maybe do not remember right now here. So several people contributed and we wrote a lot of papers and as I said, well, um, I do not want to go into all details here, but I maybe just want to tell you a little bit about the story, how this then evolved. So the first thing that happened is we published this and um, people said, yeah, this is great, but you need one vulnerability as a starting point. So it's crap. Uh, and it's true. I mean, with if you have a new piece of software, there's a new product or it's a new version of a software and you want to find a new vulnerability in there and you do not have an old one, vulnerability extrapolation cannot be used. However, we learned a lot about and this uh, code and analysis of code. And this is sometimes more important in research than the, the results of an individual paper. So we got a very good understanding of what's going on. And um, we understood that it's important to have a good representation and improve the representation and work on getting it more and closer to the task, finding vulnerabilities in a fuzzy way. And the next idea that we then pursued, uh, and we had also a small DFG project on this topic was, um, could we use anomaly detection as an approach? So we have a piece of code, we do the analysis, maybe we look at functions and we look at this function that is different from all the others. Or maybe we just look at um, data flows uh, and we look for data flows that are different from many other data flows or even we go even one step further and this is what we did we just look at checks at if statements and look for those if statements that differ than the majority of all other if, state if statements and this led us uh, to this idea the system is called uh, shaki <laughs> and um, the idea is that we have some kind of security critical sync, like a mem copy or a string copy. So uh, some position in the program where some security critical operation is taking place. And in front of this, there is maybe um, some check. So maybe there is something like an is okay as shown here. And if this is a similar 
pattern in all of these uh, code snippets that use memcopy or woo in this example, then we could do some kind of anomaly detection and look for cases where this condition differs from all the others. Um, and we did this by um, embedding the conditions in the if statements into a vector space. So we didn't use all the code, but just the if statements um, and the conditions in them. And we built a very simple model of uh, anomaly, uh, for anomaly detection. Basically, we used um, the, um, the distance uh, from a center vector. So what you do is you take all the functions that use the same security critical sync, so maybe memcopy or some other function, and then you put the conditions before these um, sinks into a vector space, and then you compute the average of this um, vector representation and measure how far are the different conditions away from the center. And if they are too far away, as in this example, this particular check is different from all the other checks. It doesn't uh, tell, by the way, that this is a vulnerability. It just tells you that this is an anomalous check. And um, obviously, that's a very interesting thing. And we also found vulnerabilities by doing this. But on the way to this, something different happened. And this changed how we then proceeded because uh, Fabian came up with a new representation of source code. And this wasn't expected. It also wasn't planned. And I think ultimately it was a design of just getting everything into a good representation for machine learning. So we constructed something um, that we called a code property graph. And that is a fusion of a syntax tree, a control flow graph, and a data flow graph. I think technically data flow graph is not the right word here. So it's a program dependence graph. Uh, but I'm saying data flow graph because in my view, it somehow reflects the data flow. Um, and it's more, it more fits this kind of theme. So here we can see a, um, a so-called code property graph. Um, it's an edge labeled multigraph with properties attached to nodes. Okay, uh, that's not important here. What's important here is that this graph captures a lot more information than the individual data structures. So on the one hand, we have the AST subgraphs here in statements. So this is a declaration. This is this declaration here. Then we have the data flow between these things. So we know that the variable x flows from this statement to that statement. So this would be from here to there. And we can also see the control flow. So here there's a predicate and or condition. Um, and if this is true, this function is called. So this should be this predicate and this call. And all of this happens within the same data structure. So we can go from let's say this source function and really see the influence on the data flow, on the control flow. And when we hit some other statements, we can also walk down and see what is the sync or the call here and what is the argument and things like that. So this was a super cool idea. And it turned also out that this can be stored extremely well in a graph database. Um, property graphs, so without the code, are a common representation in data and graph databases. So it was a perfect fit to store everything in a graph database and then run experiments only with this representation. And to the best of my knowledge, there have also been some follow-up work uh, um, by us and uh, the group at CISPA from Michael Buckis on PHP, but also there has been other applications of um, property graphs. I, I remember papers on Android, on internet attacks, and so on and so forth. So the idea I think is it's again um, a not too complicated idea, but it gives rise to a powerful representation and a very handy tool to work with. Okay, so yeah, I made some um, <laughs> some manual remarks here. Okay. So and then we found out that the anomalies that we looked at very often follow a very similar pattern. So there's a sync, a security critical sync. Um, it gets data from some source, which is uh, problematic. Let's say input from the network is going to memcopy, which sounds already like a problem. And in between, there should be a sanitization or security check or validation, but this is missing. And this led us to the idea of taint style vulnerabilities. I mean, uh, these vulnerabilities exist for a long time, but um, we could describe them very, very nicely in our graph because um, 
what we have is on the one hand the sink that lives in the AST representation. Um, we have the source that is also in our AST representation, a call to some function. And in between there's a data flow. And on the path of this data flow, there is a missing sanitization which corresponds to a missing AST that takes something like a control flow change or something that is related to um, making sure that the sync and the source do not uh, directly transfer information, but something is happening in between. And uh, in the second paper on this code property style graphs, we worked on this and we developed different templates for find these, uh, to find these vulnerabilities efficiently. And ultimately, this could be done without machine learning. Um, um, and it was far easier to use a query language for the graph database called Gremlin. And Fabian built a complete system around this called Yearn. Later, it was called Octopus, I think, um, which basically takes a code, um, puts it into a graph database, gets all these interesting uh, representations, control flow, data flow, syntax, and nowadays even likely more. And then you can find um, some kind of traversal that walks through this graph and that checks for different properties. Like, for example, is there a data flow that goes from the source to a sink without sanitization? And this is a very elegant approach for finding vulnerabilities. It doesn't guarantee that what you find is in any case a security problem, but it's super helpful for an analyst to filter data and get only candidates that are interesting. Here's an example um, that I showed uh, in the keynote presentation. Um, it's about a vulnerability that we discovered in the Linux kernel driver together with Nico Golde. Um, and uh, you can see basically um, the, this template. So this is, this is actually not code, but it's a template for a graph database query language. So it's a Gremlin um, template code. And you can see here, we are looking for some sync uh, in the kernel driver. This is a mem copy or write. Huh? Um, then we are looking for a source, data from the user space. And then we check, is there in between sufficient validation code? Like somebody checks uh, for a minimum, for example, or somebody allocates new memory, which is also some way of um, sanitizing um, input uh, data flows and things like that. And this spilled out candidates in the Linux kernel and its drivers. And it also works for Heartbleed, by the way. So we did this in retrospective. And um, also Heartbleed follows this pattern. I'm skipping the slide. But instead, I want to focus on this one. So with the help of these manually written templates, um, Fabian and Nico could find a lot of vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. 18 unknown vulnerabilities discovered in 2013. Um, they were all fixed by now. And interestingly, we even became an email from Linus Torvalds, which was very friendly. <laughs> I'm saying this because uh, we did a follow-up paper in 2016, uh, where we also spotted um, vulnerabilities related to Linux kernel. And uh, we got uh, some more like a renting email from Linus Torvalds. A rent with A and not with E. Um, so uh, we were really happy about these results and we were also really happy about the impact, not only on research, but also about, in this case, fixing a lot of problems in Linux drivers, which is always good. Um, and uh, this then concluded our journey. We did a little bit more than on finding um, uh, vulnerabilities in 64-bit uh, um, implementations. And in the last years, uh, my group has deviated a little bit from this work. So we have been moved closer to the analysis uh, with machine learning because we have these um, representations at hand. So some follow-up work is uh, um, a paper with Eileen kellis Kahn and Rachel Greenstead, where we use this representation for de-anonymizing programmers, uh, first on source code, later on um, binary code. And we now use parts of this technique in the last year um, to imitate coding style, so basically to attack code stylometry. And much of this works on having a good representation of code at hand. So what's the summary of this long <laughs> winded talk? Um, so finding vulnerabilities is difficult. I hope I could convince you in the beginning. This is not a trivial task. And please 
don't apply machine learning directly without knowing what's going on in this scenario. I think there's a very high risk of learning artifacts from the data. Um, and we have so uh, few data that is suitable for learning. Um, I think it's far better to focus on an assisted, assisted discovery of vulnerabilities. So instead of solving the task completely automatically, I would always suggest to um, uh, filter the data with machine learning or artificial intelligence, um, find the interesting stuff and give it to a human expert. And for moreover, um, we, machine learning is far better in doing boring tasks than humans, where humans are far better in solving complex problems than machine learning is. So bringing them together in a good approach would mean let the machine learning solve the boring tasks, such as analyzing and comparing subtrees, and let the human reason about whether this is a real vulnerability or just some strange but totally okay um, programming pattern. Overall, all of this, what I've been telling you, is neither sound nor complete. Um, so this is not something that gives you guarantees. And I like, as I know as security um, people, we like guarantees, um, but this is a talk that ends with no guarantee. Uh, and I think we have to live with it. We can also accept this sometimes. And we find a lot of vulnerabilities. I think in total 40 vulnerabilities in popular software. And I think for one PhD thesis, that's pretty amazing. And Maybe to add a little bit about what happened next. So um, in 2016-17, Fabian founded uh, uh, this startup uh, with some investors and um, the company is developing different security products around this technology. Um, and I think it's further developed. Unfortunately, of course, it moved a little bit away from the academic research, unfortunately for me. Uh, um, and of course, if you apply this in practice in regular business, there's far more that you need to do. So you need a graphical user interface. Uh, you need um, a documentation, things that researchers <laughs> simply don't know what, what this is actually. And of course, um, there are many challenges that haven't still been solved. So doing the same thing in native code was one of our follow-up projects. The project was called Björn. And in the aftermath, it was a failure. So um, we um, started in 2016 and we stopped this project in 2017, of 2015. Uh, we even had a Google uh, grant on this. Um, and um, although we could apply some of the concepts and we also did a paper recently on finding types in binary code, we could not transfer all of this powerful machinery into the binary world. And one of the main reasons is that we, in binary code, we have control flow and data flow, but our edges and our nodes are not properly labeled. So first of all, there's a lot of uncertainty in these representations. Even the best disassemblers and code analyzers are, have a lot of um, mistakes. So having a 100% clear control flow graph or so is not guaranteed again. Yeah. And we do not have a cool labeling. Huh? So we could say, oh, this is a basic block, this is a basic block. And in the basic block, there is some comparison instruction. Okay. Uh, could be a sanitizer or somebody checking for a buffer size, but it's not as clear as a mem copy. Or sometimes we even have re really speaking names in source code. And then the expert uh, is much quicker in seeing, hey, the function is called sanitize input. So this will be a sanitization function. Um, yeah, um, and I think this is a, is, a, is, a, is a challenge. I don't know how this proceeds. I, maybe deep learning can help in alleviating uh, this, this uh, problem and find some of these higher level constructs from the source code, maybe. And of course, I, I think it's still interesting to uh, learn about why humans can spot bugs better than machine learning. Um, this is orthogonal to deep learning research. So I'm here pointing at um, do not try to build a system that gets better and better and better, but instead, more like a human, look at a teacher. So look at how would a human solve the problem? How does the human think about the code that he or she inspects? What is his or her intuition? How is uh, the strategy behind this um, process? And can we derive knowledge from this such that we can make a learning system perform similarly or um, assist in this task. So it's the orthogonal direction. So it's not like building a system like a self-driving car uh, by recognizing street signs and things like that. 
which is currently done. But instead, like having a human drive around and the machine learning um, monitor the human over time. Some companies are, by the way, doing it. So it's, but it's not like the common approach to this. Yeah, so that's uh, basically the talk from 2017. Um, when giving it, I, I had a lot of memories uh, um, on this research. I think it was a, a very cool uh, um, research strain. Um, and uh, I enjoyed the talk. I think it's in some parts, it could be a little bit more uh, recent. So not everything that I'm tell telling here was uh, uh, the latest. So I missed the de-anonymization de attacks. I missed the 64-bit um, attacks that we talked about. I missed our part on binary analysis that I just mentioned. So it was a talk from 2017, but still, I hope you had fun. I hope you could took something home and um, stay safe, stay well. And we see us hopefully again in the real world or in another recording. Bye.